Okay, so let's take a break from Spider-Man for a minute since we've been covering a lot of that recently and let's talk about Donny Cates Hulk, which by the way, this is drawn by Ryan Otley. Not gonna lie, it's a little weird to see Donny Cates writing a comic and Ryan Stegman not drawing it. Those are the ones who did Venom, for those of you guys who don't know. Uh, it was really, really good. So those guys are kind of like a one-two punch to a degree. But uh, but this is the beginning of the new Incredible Hulk story arc under Donny Cates. So we are finished with Al Ewing's Immortal Hulk. That's kind of a self-contained story. Uh, this one kind of builds off of it, but we may do a full story. Let me know if you guys are interested in seeing like an Immortal Hulk full story video. I don't think we've done that yet. But something else to also keep in mind is that this is a monthly series. So this will be coming out once every month. Uh, so we won't be covering it like every week or every day. Like we'll cover them as they come out. But what this does here is this basically picks up with the Incredible Hulk, like punching against a wall, which is kind of a weird thing, right? It's literally just like a giant door kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And we get this sort of, you know, exposition here, right? It says things like, you know, I have long held a theory about the Hulk uh, that I've never shared it before because quite frankly, it terrifies me to the very core that we've always thought of the Hulk as the manifestation of Dr. Banner's trauma that he experienced as a child, or perhaps his ID, his shadow, his fury. And then the question becomes, but what if the Hulk is none of those things? What if it exists to protect us from Banner himself? And that's a cool thing, right? So one of the great things about Donny Cates, those of you guys who don't know, he's very, 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 very good at looking at the status quo for an existing character and then flipping it on its head. And so what you end up doing is actually switching to this discussion between Bruce Banner and Betty Ross. And it's kind of a crazy thing because of course he tells her, you know, Betty, you're not supposed to be here. And she really approaches him with this conversation about what he's doing with the Hulk, that he can't simply keep the Incredible Hulk locked into that particular location. Now, this is kind of interesting because what Donnie Cates is doing is kind of toying with us a little bit in relation to like Jason Aaron's Incredible Hulk run and then like the traditional Incredible Hulk mythos. And the reason why I say that is because as you guys know, with the traditional Incredible Hulk mythos, the Hulk is a manifestation of Banner. So they're basically two different people sharing the same body, right? Like Bruce Banner physically transforms into the Incredible Hulk. What Jason Aaron did during his run on Hulk is he actually wrote a story whereby the two of them were split. So you had Bruce Banner in a separate body from the Incredible Hulk. And that's happened over the years, right? During the Onslaught saga, for example, the psychic consciousness of Bruce Banner was removed from the Incredible Hulk in order to provide a kind of just pure savage Hulk that was really the most powerful version of his character we'd seen up to that point. That was the only real means to basically defeat or at least find a way to defeat Onslaught, that kind of a thing. And so Donny Cates isn't really creating new ground here. He's kind of retreading existing ground, but doing it in his own way, which is a cool thing. And so ultimately Banner's response to Betty is one of hostility, at least as it pertains to the Hulk. That Betty kind of views the Incredible Hulk as very much like a child. And he really is, right? The Incredible Hulk is very childlike in terms of how he operates, unless you're talking about World Breaker Hulk or something like that. But Savage Hulk is very, very childlike in that way. And so what Betty says is that she's concerned about this because hurting the Incredible Hulk is hurting Banner. And it's one of those things where she's like, you can't blame yourself for what happened in El Paso. Now, for those of you guys who are approaching this from the perspective of, okay, did I miss something from Immortal Hulk? No, you didn't. There was a recent interview that Donny Cates did where he answered that question because it was the one thing that people wanted to know was like, okay, did we miss something from Immortal Hulk that happened in El Paso or something like that? And during his interview with comicbook.com, he said, no, like it's a thing that has not been revealed yet. It's just something that took place between the end of Immortal Hulk and the beginning of this run. But whatever it was that took place out there, Banner just kind of freaks out and says he doesn't really blame himself. He blames the Incredible Hulk. And so ultimately his feelings about how the world perceives him really come out and manifest here. And this is something that you don't readily see from Banner, where Betty says that like, you're scaring me, right? You can't act like this. You don't sound like yourself. Then the response of Banner is, and how would you know what I sound like, right? How would anybody know? The only time I'm ever useful to any of you all is when I'm not here, when you need the Incredible Hulk. And he says, I never wanted any of this, right? I never wanted to be a superhero or a defender or an Avenger or a monster. He's like, I never wanted to do any of this stuff. All I wanted to do was push boundaries. All I wanted to be was a man of science. And so he says, at the end of the day, it didn't work. Like none of that happened. And so because of that, he says like this, this whole thing, right? Like this incredible Hulk, it grew inside of me, like some kind of a tumor, some kind of an illness, you know? And, and I was a fool to believe that it would ever stop growing in the first place to believe that I could somehow control the Hulk or contain the Hulk. That after the events of, of dealing with the one below all and the one above all, that I somehow had a stronger grasp on all this. I was a fool to believe any of that. But more so than that, the biggest concern that Bruce Banner has is that at some point in time, 
time, the Incredible Hulk is going to manifest. He's going to take over. And his fear is not that the Incredible Hulk is going to kill his friends or anything like that. It's that the Incredible Hulk will stay that way. That Banner will never come back out again, right? That the Incredible Hulk will basically find a way to stay in control and you'll never ever see Banner. He'll lose himself. And that's one of the funny things where again, Donny Cates is building on history here, specifically with Peter David's The Incredible Hulk, The End. For those of you guys who never read that story, it was a phenomenal story where basically the Incredible Hulk was the last living thing on earth, right? Well, not really thing. He was the last living uh, superhero, last living person on earth. And that all that was left after this just catastrophic nuclear war was basically just him and like giant bugs that would eat him on a daily basis and he would heal himself and all that kind of stuff. But there's one point near the end of the story or really at the end of the story where he lashes out his banner who's basically grown old and he screams at Banner that like, I want you to go away, right? Hulk just wants to be alone. And then the Banner persona basically dies of old age, however that works. And so because of that, the Incredible Hulk is eternally left alone on Earth. Like he'll just be on Earth forever and that'll be it until such a time that either Earth is colonized by some alien race or life begins anew and begins to evolve that the Incredible Hulk will seemingly just live on forever as the only occupant of the planet Earth itself unless he finds a way to leave. The important thing is this is one of those stories that Donny Cates is referencing here. And so it's kind of an interesting thing because in the end, we kind of find out to a degree what's really going on here when Banner tells Betty Ross, get out of my head, right? Like get out of my head and leave me alone. This is how it might as well end. And so what he does here is he sits on what's basically like a captain's chair. And then he says like, these waves do not crash on me. They break on me because I, I am strong. And then from there, you basically switch over to the Avengers. I know it's weird, but it makes perfect sense here in a second. And I really love what Donny Cates is doing here, right? So the first thing you do is you pick up with Spider-Man, who's basically talking to the rest of the fully assembled Avengers and the Fantastic Four. And the question that's asked is like, okay, is anybody else super confused about what's going on here? <laughs> and the response of Doctor Strange is, what Bruce Banner has managed to achieve here goes beyond anything anybody has done, right? That in effect, the Incredible Hulk becomes the single most powerful being on the face of the planet. And here's the reason why. It's one of those things where you can kind of extrapolate it. But the idea is that when Doctor Strange starts talking about this, he says that what he's built, that not even Doctor Strange could have achieved it, right? The Doctor Strange says he scoured the earth, searching and questioning every mystic and omega level telepath that he could possibly find to see if they could do such a thing. And none of them could. Bruce Banner managed to achieve something that the most powerful beings on the face of the planet were unable to do himself. But then Strange says there's no way that Banner could have done it himself, that it just doesn't make any sense. The magic required is just beyond anything. And so at the end of the day, of course, Captain America kind of reels him back in and says, tell us what's going on. And so what we end up learning here is that Bruce Banner had basically fractured his mind into three distinct parts. And by unifying these parts, but controlling them individually, he's basically made what's being referred to as a starship right now. The term starship is a loose term here. This is not something like the end of, of like Moonwalker, right? Where like Michael Jackson turned into a ship and flew away. That's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> It's, it's the phrase or the term starship in relation to basically how the Incredible Hulk exists right now. Now, the other thing about this is that the Incredible Hulk is making its way towards Wondegore Mountain looking for a particular thing. And it's kind of crazy because along the way, he's basically fighting Iron Man and four Hulkbuster armors, which is nuts, and he's overpowering them all. But what Doctor Strange tells us is that these three distinct parts are eloquently designed and really work as a singular cohesive unit. What Banner had done first and foremost is he had stolen technology from advanced idea mechanics and then basically used that technology to enhance the skin for lack of a better word of the Incredible Hulk. Basically he's made the Incredible Hulk more durable than he was before as if he needed it. The Incredible Hulk was already one of the most durable beings out there like being able to successfully physically injure the Hulk is no small thing. I mean you could make his nose bleed if you were strong enough right like the thing has done that but if you're talking about like literally cutting the Hulk removing a limb or something like that, you need something like adamantium, possibly vibranium, and most likely something like carbonadium or the Muramasa blade in order to pull that off. You would need a highly specialized weapon to achieve that. What Banner's done here is basically push that durability beyond what we've previously seen with his character. And we'll actually see how far deep that goes because it gets nuts. The second thing that Banner's done is he's built this giant mind palace like nothing Doctor Strange has ever seen before. So much so that there's not a singular telepath on 
Earth that can get through it. No one can break through it. Emma Frost, Professor Xavier of the X-Men, no one can break through this psychic barrier that Bruce Banner has erected in the mind of the Incredible Hulk. And then following that, of course, you have this kind of, you know, conversation, not really a conversation so much as just taunting back and forth between Banner and Iron Man, right? Where it's kind of like, you know, yada, yada, you can't beat me, so on and so forth. But like he crushes them all. In terms of the durability of Iron Man, this is where things get cool. So one of the things that he does here is he basically fires off what are basically these rockets that have adamantium nanoparticle shrapnel inside of them. In effect, what happens, these are like little just tiny shards of adamantium. They burrow themselves into the body of whatever their target happens to be. And then due to their nano programming, they basically forge the adamantium at an atomic level. In effect, adamantium grows from the inside out. And so for the Incredible Hulk, this is designed to grow in the form of a cage to basically lock him down in place. And so that's when you get into the third thing or the third aspect of what Bruce Banner's done here, that the Incredible Hulk itself is powered by rage, right? As you guys know, the angrier the Incredible Hulk gets, the stronger he gets. What if you were able to find a way to weaponize that. And so that's what Banner's done. That Banner sitting in this kind of captain's chair is basically controlling the body of the Incredible Hulk. But what of the Incredible Hulk's consciousness? Banner has actually taken that and locked it away. And that's what you saw in that opening scene when he was punching on that door, that Banner has imprisoned the psyche of the Incredible Hulk and then basically subjects him to constant bombardment by enemy forces whenever he needs him to become angry. And because the Incredible Hulk is childlike, the Incredible Hulk is going to attack whatever it is that's attacking him, and he's going to become angrier the longer the conflict goes on. Because these are basically infinite armies that would be attacking him, he would just become angrier and angrier and angrier. Basically, Bruce Banner's found a way to weaponize the Incredible Hulk's rage. That rage is the engine that Bruce Banner's using. So what's basically going on here, to kind of give you guys a better perception, is that Bruce Banner used technology to modify the body of the Incredible Hulk to make him more durable. He in turn took over the mind of the Incredible Hulk and he uses the Incredible Hulk's rage to decide how angrier and how powerful the Incredible Hulk is going to get. So basically just imagine that at any point in time in any fight that uh, that Bruce Banner could just amp the Incredible Hulk up to like World Breaker levels on a whim. That's what we're talking about here. Weaponized World Breaker Hulk. It's nuts. And so in this conflict, because of the fact that the adamantium is basically holding him in place and not even the Incredible Hulk is strong enough to physically break through adamantium, he actually rips his arm out of it. And when he does, it literally tears his arm off, like, which is kind of crazy. So he's basically pummeling Tony Stark with one arm against all these Hulkbuster suits, right? Like literally all these Hulkbuster suits that he has are getting totally obliterated with his one arm. And then he takes one of the arms of the Hulkbuster suits and attaches it to his snapped arm, right? To his arm that was ripped off and then just goes forward from there. And so what you end up finding is that the immortal Hulk traveling here, of course, once his arm is basically healed, which really only took a couple of minutes, right? If that, maybe like 30 seconds to fully heal, which gives you a real indication of just how powerful and durable he is, that what he was looking for was actually something that Tony Stark built, Project Ark. So the idea behind this is that in the aftermath of the events of King and Black, when Null had attacked the world, that Null overcame the world super fast, right? Showing up with Celestials, different things like that. And Tony Stark, who is ever the futurist, began developing a kind of suit of armor that would serve one part as protection and then one part as basically a gateway, as a wormhole. And that's why you see in its chest is what looks like a giant portal slash energy source where the arc reactor would normally be. And what would happen here is that in a time of a massive emergency, he could actually evacuate the world's population through this thing. Now, the other thing about it, and those of you guys who are X-Men fans, is probably not lost on you. This looks like Master Mold. And I have to believe there's probably a reason for that. But what this looks like because of the fact that Tony Stark piloted a celestial is that it looks like it's a celestial killer armor is what it looks like, right? Like Iron Man's celestial killer armor, which is kind of nuts. But at the end of the day, the response of Hulk is I'm going to need to borrow this. So, you know, despite Tony Stark begging for him not to, that the math is not complete. He has no idea where he'll go if he passes through that portal, if he'll basically take control of the suit of armor itself, or if he'll end up in some hellish dimension or the realm of Mephisto or the negative zone. There's no way to know what'll happen. The response of Banner is, I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. What I want to achieve is more important. So he literally travels through the portal to a future destination and we have no idea what awaits him there. 
All right, what's going on guys? This is Rob and I forgot <laughs> that Hulk number two was coming out two weeks after Hulk number one. Now, after this, it's only coming out every month. So we'll have to wait like a month before we cover the next issue. I know it sucks. One of the things a lot of you guys have voiced a concern about is that sometimes it's hard to keep track of stories. So what I'm gonna do is I'm actually just gonna kind of create playlists for the individual stories that we're doing. So they're super easy to follow. We'll probably end up with a million playlists, but there's no such thing as too many playlists on YouTube. So. For those of you guys who are following Devil's Reign, you'll actually find a link to the playlist in that video, which right now only has one video. And then for this one, uh, you'll find a link to the playlist, uh, both for this individual story arc, and this video will also be added into the main playlist for the Incredible Hulk. So that'll make it easier to follow along. Having said that, so in the first video, what we kind of talked about and, and what we ran over here was really the change that was going on with the Incredible Hulk. This idea that what Banner had done in the aftermath of like everything that Al Ewing had done which was just a ridiculously amazing story, which we still need to release a full story for, for Immortal Hulk. Um, that what's happened here is Banner has basically weaponized the Incredible Hulk in so far that he basically turned him into a ship. Because the Incredible Hulk is so incredibly durable and so powerful, he can survive in almost any environment. And one of the things that was established in Jason Aaron's run is that the Incredible Hulk's physiology can actually adapt to an environment. So he wasn't able to breathe underwater until he was. <laughs> and so what this means is that with Banner basically can controlling the mind of the Incredible Hulk and the Incredible Hulk's rage being used as quote unquote, the engine that drives the ship, that he's basically able to do almost anything he wants to. And so far as executing plans, we don't really know what this plan is. What we do know is that Banner basically seized control of basically celestial tech and then in turn traveled into the multiverse. Now, the funny thing about this is that as soon as he leaves his universe, he comes across a group that's referred to as the alternate universe timeline hazard operations response and intervention team with some other word that starts with why it's authority this looks like authority from dc comics for those of you guys who don't know who that is the authority is actually a group that operates essentially in the multiverse but they they well they've served different purposes but they're a wild storm team uh we haven't really talked about them and maybe we should we haven't really done much in the way of, of wild storm but this is hilarious because at the end of the day he just plows through <laughs> I mean, none of these guys really have a chance, but it is kind of a funny thing to see. I mean, tell me this ship in the background does not look like the ship of the authority from Wildstorm. They're basically a pastiche, right? I mean, even if they're not exactly those characters, they're basically a pastiche. But when it comes to the multiverse, and this is one of the things I want to talk about. We, we I like to reiterate this every so often for people who were either new or who have been here for a while and need a bit of a refresher. There are a lot of teams that patrol the multiverse for different reasons. Like the exiles travel from one universe to the other, just basically solving problems. And we should come the original, like not really the original, but like the Exiles run uh, that basically went into what was basically House of M and all that kind of stuff, did like the world tour storyline and all that. We should probably cover that because the Exiles are like the most underappreciated, but more most amazing team in Marvel Comics. Like literally it's just a team that travels to alternate realities. All their, like every one of their stories was awesome. There was never a boring story in the Exiles, but nonetheless, these guys are obliterated pretty quickly. <laughs> the other thing behind this is that Banner is basically asleep at the wheel and it kind Kind of makes sense, right? I mean, it's a pretty exhausting situation to be in, controlling a giant green rage monster and then, you know, sending him into space. A lot's happened over the course of the day. A lot's happened over the course of the day. And so once Banner starts to wake up, what you actually end up finding out here is they're being targeted. And the reason why is because there's somebody out there or something out there that's trying to get their hands on the Hulk for reasons we don't necessarily know. We simply know that they are. But again, this is the nature of using the Incredible Hulk's rage as an engine system that where this really we could call like kind of a physical tractor beam is trying to pull the, the Incredible Hulk in. That Banner amps his rage up, right? As a means to just kind of keep the, or at least push the Incredible Hulk to higher levels. Think of this as something akin to like NOS in a car, except you can regulate how much NOS you basically allow in that car. And you basically have it just increasing in power forever, right? Is, is kind of the big difference here. But again, like monsters are basically introduced that's set upon the Incredible Hulk. One of which is Fen Fang Foom. Uh, spoilers. Have you guys played the Guardians of the Galaxy game yet? Dude, that game is amazing. I just finished it like a couple days ago. Dude, that game is amazing. Fen Fang Foom looked awesome in that game. When, they, when they're like, we need to go find Fen Fang Foom, I was like, yes! <laughs> 
I really can't wait to see this. But the thing behind this is that again, these are just monsters. And the Incredible Hulk in what's essentially his, his almost like infantile form, his savage form, just sees them as a credible threat and attacks them. That's one of the benefits that Banner's kind of waiting for when it comes to the Incredible Hulk. If the Incredible Hulk has not figured out this is an illusion. Now, this is one of the big differences between what Donny Cates is doing and what Al Ewing is doing. That in a lot of ways, Al Ewing depicted the intelligence of the Immortal Hulk, or at least his ability to understand his surroundings as being on par with Banner, right? I mean, the Immortal Hulk was not as intelligent as Banner, right? It wasn't one of those things where he's like practicing science and things like that. Certainly not on the same level that Banner was, but he was certainly a lot more cognizant of what was going on around him, right? He was able to understand what was taking place in a more nuanced way than what Savage Hulk is able to do. Now, whether or not this means the Immortal Hulk slash Devil Hulk persona is gone forever or is temporarily just kind of retreated is something that only time will tell, right? We'll just kind of have to wait and, and watch as Donny Cates' run progress to find out how this happens. But regardless, with the Immortal Hulk's anger being amped up more and more, at the end of the day, Banner's told that the origin of this entity is unknown, but according to their sensors, they're being scanned. And when it turns out they're being scanned for gamma radiation, the initial response of Banner is, it's the Avengers, right? Like they're trying to find him or they have found him and they're basically trying to bring this guy back, right? They're trying to reel him back into the universe because the reality is he's not supposed to be out there, right? Like he, he overpowered the Avengers in order to get to this. And so following that, you basically have him, of course, taking out Fin Fang Foom and, you know, the, the Incredible Hulk destroys these forces or whatever. And so Banner needs more rage. And so as a really great throwback, he basically amps him up and has a giant version of Wolverine appear here. Now, on the surface, you would think that if what Banner wanted to do was to maximize the rage of the Hulk, that he would somehow find a way to unlock the World Breaker Hulk rage level, right? To make him, you know, as angry as he's, as he's ever been. But there's a couple reasons for why we can surmise this is not really happening. The first is that to go from just Hulk who's kind of chill and relaxed, or at least is, you know, kind of minimally angry, we can call him that, to like World Breaker Hulk could possibly just destroy his form, right? Like, I mean, destroy the, the engine, so to speak, right? The other part of this is that given the fact that the, the World Breaker Hulk form is essentially a more cognizant and intelligent version of Savage Hulk, that what this would mean is that it would figure out it's all an illusion, right? Like World Breaker Hulk would figure out what's going on and then basically just stop, right? And just, just cease to fight and just kind of maybe revert back to a base form and call it a day. There's a few different reasons for why we can discern that's not necessarily happening. The other cool thing here is that this being a throwback is to the old Wolverine first appearance when he fought the Incredible Hulk. This is how he looked, right? This, this is this is how Wolverine looked back in the day. Not only that, as most of you guys know, uh, the Incredible Hulk and Wolverine have had some ridiculously good fights, especially with that animated movie, right? Hulk versus, and it's like Wolverine and Thor. You guys remember that movie? That movie was awesome. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch that movie as soon as I finish with this video. But like, it was a it was a great movie, right? It was it was a great thing. I absolutely loved it. Uh, but there's been some great battles here, right? And there's a lot of I wouldn't say animosity, but Wolverine kind of represents this being that's very difficult for the Incredible Hulk to take out. And so the Incredible Hulk's rage just kind of keeps going and going and going. But as the fight breaks on or continues on between Wolverine and uh, and and the Incredible Hulk, the Hulk's not getting as angry as he needs to be. The engines themselves are also critical. So it's almost as though the engines kind of match what the Hulk is going through. Now you do get some cool moments, right? Where like giant Wolverine goes, you know, goes to stab the immortal Hulk and his claws get stuck in the ground and Hulk rips out one of Wolverine's claws, which is awesome. It's just ridiculously cool to see. But the, the this kind of disembodied Betty Ross, right? Who almost seems to be a voice in Banner's head to a degree, seemingly his conscience kind of chimes in and is like, you're pushing the incredible Hulk too far. Like if you keep on doing this, either he's gonna break, he's gonna shut down and he's basically like that, that persona is gonna be destroyed, possibly replaced with another or simply just losing your ability to power this engine entirely or everything's gonna go belly up. The crazy thing about this is that if this version of the Incredible Hulk is seemingly defeated slash destroyed, that what would happen is Banner would revert back into his human form, right? Like remember, all this is essentially taking place in the mindscape, right? Like this ship that Banner's sitting in is the brain of the Incredible Hulk and the Incredible Hulk himself is just his persona fighting all these enemies that Banner's making him see that appear to be real, but actually aren't, right? That's one thing to keep in mind. This is not happening on some planet somewhere, right? That's, that's not really what's going on here, but that if this version of the Incredible Hulk is defeated or destroyed, that the Incredible Hulk will revert back in, into his human form and Banner cannot withstand the rigors of the multiverse in his current form, right? Like, like as a human being, he cannot withstand that. He would basically be destroyed. And so that's why there's a bit of desperation here. That's why there's a bit of a desire to, to kind of push the Incredible Hulk more and more and find some way to get past this. Ultimately though, the Incredible Hulk succumbs to this, this kind of tractor 
system that's pulling him in and there's no conceivable way for them to find a way out. And so essentially, once they're pulled back in here or, or into this particular location, they crash land in what basically looks like a cave with a kind of stasis field that's keeping the Incredible Hulk in place. Now, we're not really given the details of this stasis field and in reality, we don't really need them, but I would surmise that given how it's technology-based, it's likely one of those things where it basically reinforces the strength of the Incredible Hulk. So for every punch he doles out, that level of strength is amplified two times over by the shield. So basically the shield is always more durable than the Incredible Hulk is, right? Like the Incredible Hulk strength works against him and being able to try to break out of this thing. The crazy thing is that there's just this kind of guy out there, right? Like this, this person out there that you can't really make out that says that like after all these years, they finally caught him, right? They finally caught this person. And where Banner doesn't know what's going on, right? Like who in the hell are you? Like what, what in the heck is happening here? The, the person kind of chimes in and says, wow, you're wildly different from all the rest of them, right? You can speak, you can reason, and you're in control. Like, this is kind of weird. Like, don't be afraid. I mean you no harm. My name is Dr. Bruce Banner. This looks like Bruce Banner from an alternate reality. Now, try as I might, this is not an existing version of Bruce Banner that I'm familiar with, and I've searched high and low. This is not a version of Banner that we've seen before. So it's not like the Incredible Hulk's landed in like the House of M universe, and this is Banner in that universe. This is a seemingly a reality that we've never seen before, which makes me wildly excited to see what Donny Cates is going to do here. What's going on guys? This is Rob and we are back with the Hulk, right? With uh, with Hulk part three. And and I don't know why I keep getting the wires crossed with like Donny Cates and Al Ewing. Like in the Venom video, we were like, it's Donny Cates' Venom, but it's actually Al Ewing's Venom. It's probably because the two of them directly switched stories, which always throws me off. Donny Cates was writing Venom, Al Ewing was writing Hulk, then they switched and Donny Cates is writing Hulk and Al Ewing's writing Venom. And it just, it takes me for a loop sometimes. So I may make that mistake a couple more times. Hopefully not. Uh, I'll try to make sure I don't. But but the whole idea behind The Incredible Hulk as Donny Cates is writing it right now uh, is that basically Bruce Banner is piloting The Incredible Hulk. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you want to get caught up, make sure you guys check out the playlist down in the description, which will not only have this Incredible Hulk story all the way at the bottom, but will also have a whole bunch of other Incredible Hulk stuff to go along with it, including the Immortal Hulk. Uh, but the whole thing behind this is that Banner is basically in an alternate reality. And the crazy thing is that this alternate reality he's in is one that's actually occupied by a, another version of Bruce Banner. Now, before we get into that, there is something really important here. And this is one of those instances where Donny Cates teases a thing and and then kind of gives us this slow introduction. It's usually what he always does. You can set your watch to it, right? So he'll give us like the first two issues, which will set the stage. And then we'll get issue number three, which is something's coming. And then we'll get issue number four, which may or may not focus on that. And then with five and six, we'll basically come to the fruition of what's going on with the thing he discussed, assuming he's gonna keep it confined to those six issues and not really like build it up as something that'll show up in like, you know, 12 or 24 issues later on down the line. But the thing about this, and, and really the big question that we'd all had is that at the end of Al Ewing's run on the Immortal Hulk, that Banner and Hulk had basically kind of found a way to work in unison, right? There was harmony there, as there usually always is when it comes to the ending of a Hulk story. What we didn't know is what had happened between the time of the ending of Immortal Hulk and the events in El Paso when things had basically popped off and the Incredible Hulk had somehow lost his mind and started tearing everything up. That what had basically happened is things had kind of gone back to the status quo. That basically whenever the Incredible Hulk essentially came on, that that where he and Banner would kind of work in unison and both would basically know what the other one was doing, that Banner was basically shut out. And so things started going nuts and he didn't fully understand what was happening. The other part of this is that when the, when the questions asked what happened, like, like, you know, his belief being that like the Incredible Hulk had basically just taken over, shut Banner's mind out, and then went on a, a war path in El Paso, killed a whole bunch of people, and then basically, re, you know, kind of reverted back into Banner, that instead there's something else going on here, that seemingly there's another kind of Hulk Hulk presence that's there, almost demonic in nature, and then just basically refers to Banner as being weak and then kills Banner right off the bat. Now, of course, this is him seemingly having like a dream experience. It's not actually him experiencing that. So we don't know exactly how this unfolded. If it was a vision that took place in El Paso, if it's something that he's just imagining, right? Some sort of way for him to kind of cope with the, the things that like the Incredible Hulk actually did in El Paso. We don't necessarily know. All we know is that he basically wakes up in this alternate reality and and is met with this version of Bruce Banner. Now, the crazy thing about this is that this alternate reality version of Banner, as he says, he describes him as being magnificent and says, I have never met an abomination with such agency before. And so seemingly in this alternate reality, there appears to be more than one Hulk and those various versions that are out there don't really have the same kind of intelligence that Bruce Banner does.
does. Now, the funny thing about this is that this is kind of the exception to the rule, whether it's because of the fact that Bruce Banner is basically controlling the Incredible Hulk, so like piloting the Hulk and using the Hulk's anger as a means to essentially control his body to increase his strength or decrease his strength as needed, or previous iterations where you had like Professor Hulk or even like Worldbreaker Hulk or something like that, that regardless of the situation, seemingly this alternate reality version of Banner has never encountered that. And so when the, the main Marvel Universe Banner introduced himself as I am basically Bruce Banner and I'm controlling the Incredible Hulk, I'm piloting him, basically like my mind is controlling the body, then this alternate reality version of Banner is like, okay, that's interesting. I'm curious about this. And so of course with the Incredible Hulk persona, it really is his mind kind of facing off against all these different threats, that Banner shuts the threats down, which of course lead to the Incredible Hulk persona basically calming down, right? Remember, that's how this whole thing works. The Incredible Hulk is basically the engine that you have the physical Incredible Hulk's body, but you have the mind of Bruce Banner that's controlling the Incredible Hulk's body and that what you have is the Incredible Hulk mind, basically the Savage Hulk's mind, being forced to fight enemy after enemy after enemy, increasing his rage, which allows the Incredible Hulk to stay strong. So Banner can basically control the Hulk's strength, right? Remember, that's kind of the, the thing that's going on here. It's interesting and it's kind of metatextual, but in the midst of all this kind of happening, the Incredible Hulk persona meets with what looks like this kind of dark demonic devil Hulk version. The crazy thing is that he seems to have seen him before. It's one of those things where he's like, you, right? Like, who are you? And then when this version takes off, the Hulk kind of chases after him, right? And it's like, please come back. So it's an interesting concept because it looks as though the Incredible Hulk wants this kind of devil version of himself or this being or whatever it is this happens to be. Again, we don't fully know what's going on here. The important thing that, that to really discuss here is basically main Marvel Universe Banner talking to alternate Banner. And what we get is this bit of an origin story in that this alternate reality universe version of Bruce Banner says that unlike the main Marvel Universe where the Gamma Bomb had gone off, but Banner had basically pushed Rick Jones out of the way, was exposed to the radiation, and then became the Incredible Hulk, leading to General Thunderbolt Ross and all those guys writing the whole thing off as, as a failure and basically saying aftermath of this is basically just too dangerous, that in this alternate reality, it worked, right? The Gamma Bomb went off without a hitch. Banner was not caught in the blast. He never became the Incredible Hulk or anything along those lines. But in his naivety, he believed that this would only lead to a kind of second atomic age, right? That in the aftermath of humanity discovering atomic energy, that yeah, I mean, it gave us the Cold War and the fear that the United States and the Soviet Union were going to wipe themselves off the map, but it also gave us microwaves and all kinds of technology. And so the thought of Banner is that sure, this could potentially be used for destructive capabilities, but if for no other reason than self-preservation, humanity would not necessarily be quick on the trigger in terms of just detonating all these gamma bombs across the world in some major conflict. Instead, they would use gamma technology as basically a source of energy to kind of enter into a new age of human evolution. Instead, the worst fears of Banner come true, that there seemed to have been some kind of just massive global calamity. And what they ended up doing with the powers that be, as he describes them, taking their weapons and then basically detonating them across the world, everywhere except for the United States is hit. And so what he says, that this whole thing had basically turned the United States into the greatest empire in the world. Seemingly, it was the US that struck first. For whatever reason, which is not really explained here, what seems to have happened is that the United States using gamma bombs targeted the rest of the world and then detonated all those gamma bombs in populated areas across the world, leaving only itself as seemingly the last functioning empire in the world, or the last functioning country in the world. And so Banner has basically been trying to continually atone for his sins. And when the question's asked, what are you doing to, to atone for your sins? How does all this work? He basically says that the ensuing radiation from these gamma bomb attacks basically affected everybody across the world. Those individuals who weren't killed in the explosions were transformed into hulks. But instead of them simply just being like hulks as you expect them, right? Just like running around and, and like an incredible hulk type person. Instead, they're all irradiated. So some of them look like, look like crabs. Some of them are just kind of like welded in place and it's just like hulk heads or whatever the case is. And sometimes like you do see a kind of version of the hulk that basically escapes. Here's the irony of all this. This is almost exactly how the events played out in Greg Pak's Planet Hulk event as part of Secret War. Right. The big difference here is that in that story, everybody in the world were changed into like tried and true Incredible Hulks, right? Incredible Hulks or She-Hulks. And like that was basically it. They weren't really mutated or anything like that. It's just everybody in the world became a Hulk. Here, it's really a, 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 an interesting blend between the events of Greg Pak's Planet Hulk from Secret Wars, which I think was part of like War Zones or something like that. And then uh, the events of and 
Incredible Hulk The End by Peter David, right, where basically the world was destroyed in, in nuclear war. All the heroes and all the villains had basically died out and the Incredible Hulk and Banner were like the last two people on Earth until the Bruce Banner persona had a heart attack and died, and then it was just The Incredible Hulk. And, and I don't really know how a persona has a heart attack and dies, but regardless, it's a very interesting blend between these two things. The other part of this is that because these Hulks kind of appear out in the world every once in a while, and because this alternate reality version of Banner referred to them as abominations, the question that the main Marvel Universe Banner is, where are they, right? When you find these Hulks and you capture them, where do they go? What do you do with them? And he's like, I found them in the same place that I found you, right? Out in the void. That basically what this alternate reality version of Banner has been doing is every time he finds a Hulk, he basically throws them out into the void of the multiverse, right? Just sort of throws them out there into existence. He doesn't know what happens to them. He doesn't really know where they go. And it's not really his concern. And he does this because he's instructed to. And when the question is asked by Banner, who instructs you to do this? Who tells you to just throw these incredible hulks away, right? To just throw them out, right? To, to maybe study them for a little while and then throw them into the void. Who tells you this? Who is the person that's in charge here? And the response to this alternate reality version of Banner is, my father is. It's this father-in-law, President Thunderbolt Ross. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are back with Donny Kate's run on The Incredible Hulk. And in the last video, we basically ended things seemingly with this idea that Bruce Banner essentially seemed to work for like General Thunderbolt Ross, or at the very least, was subservient to General Thunderbolt Ross, who of course had become President of the United States. Now the other part of this is this reality is given a numerical designation, which usually happens faster than this, but this is referred to as Earth-122, so maybe that's something that'll become important later on down the line. I'm not entirely sure. Usually whenever Marvel actually assigns a numerical designation to an alternate reality, it usually means that alternate reality will appear in the future. So again, that's why I say you may or may not want to keep it in the back of your head. The thing about this is that as we know, uh, basically Thunderbolt Ross ends up discovering or finding out that there is a kind of enormous amount of gamma energy that it basically spiked from a specific mountain range. And what this does is it seems to indicate that Bruce Banner is actually in hiding from General Thunderbolt. Ross, that he's not actually working for Thunderbolt Ross per se, and that what ends up happening here is Thunderbolt Ross, of course, is like, send everything, right? Like, get all the dropships going and everything like that, and I want to be there when it all happens. Now, here's the thing to understand. This would never be allowed to happen. The President of the United States would never be allowed to enter an active war zone. The Secret Service would keep that from happening, right? It just, it, like, the President's not allowed to put himself in harm's way like that. I mean, he wouldn't even be allowed to get close. He would never be allowed to enter an active war zone. <laughs> <laughs> but at the end of the day, as Grant Morrison once said, this is comics and none of it's real. So why does it matter? So here's the other thing about this. The big question that we kind of had to ask here is what's going on with the rest of the world? Now, we don't necessarily get this in depth. We do get a couple questions answered, but really we basically end up finding out that it's largely Tony Stark who killed the world. Not Tony Stark directly, but the technology of Tony Stark. That what ended up happening is that with everything following the way that it did, right? The Gamma Revolution, as it was called, all these people with like gamma energy basically popping up all over the place, that what it did is it made Stark technologies essentially obsolete. Now, this is an important thing because before Tony Stark became Iron Man, as most of you guys know, he was a weapons manufacturer. And whether it's because you've seen the movie or you've read the comics, it was basically the art of war, right? The danger that comes with war itself and like the loss of innocent lives and the fact that Tony Stark was forced to face that fact when he was kidnapped, well, really during the Vietnam War in the comics versus uh, during the Afghan conflict in uh, in the movies that he ended up turning over a new leaf and basically using his technology in order to one, make the world better, as well as turning himself into an Avenger. The difference here is that because this whole Gamma Revolution happened before Tony Stark became Iron Man, or at least maybe after he became Iron Man, the Stark Industries had no real value. And so the result of this is that Tony Stark filed for bankruptcy, right? Like literally his company's value just plummeted because he wasn't offering anything that was better than the whole Gamma Revolution, right? The idea of like Gamma powered beings. And and so what this meant is that eventually his company was absorbed. Now, we're not really told who it was that absorbed his company, whether it was Justin Hammer or anything like that, or even just the federal government itself. The important thing here is that ultimately Tony Stark ended up just dying of his alcoholism, right? He ended up being found dead outside of a bar from alcohol toxicity and basically chronic pancreatitis. Following that, the technology of Tony Stark was basically used, presumably by the government, to kind of bridge the gap between the gamma radiation 
of the Incredible Hulk and the technology of Stark to create these basically gamma-powered Stark uh, robots, right? And then in turn, they started wiping out everything, right? Like literally the X-Men popped up shortly after that and they were all just annihilated by the federal government, right? Just totally wiped out completely. Now, the thing about this is that this looks like it takes place around the time of giant size X-Men. So not only were the X-Men eradicated by the forces of basically the government using Stark tech, but they also nuked the entirety of the Xavier School for Gifted Youngsters. Now, we're not really given much outside of that. It's really just kind of banner reading about all this stuff in this alternate reality. But what we could also largely surmise here is that when he starts asking questions like, is there nobody left, right? What about Blade or Moon Knight or like Captain America or even like Spider-Man? That like the response of this alternate reality banner is like, I don't, okay, Blade or Moon, like I have no idea what you're talking about. So seemingly there is no Blade, there is no Moon Knight, which is really kind of interesting because in the main Marvel Universe, Eric Brooks became Blade pretty early on and he's been around for quite some time. So seemingly he may still be around and just nobody knows about him or maybe he just never really came into existence at all. Uh, Captain America may still very well be frozen in ice. It's just one of those things where we're not really given a whole lot of answers. Maybe we will get them at a, at a, at a later point in time, but at the moment, we don't really know what's happening. The crazy thing about this though, is that in the middle of all this, you basically end up having like the forces of Thunderbolt Raw, so basically the US government that descend on this mountain range where you have the main Marvel Universe banner and this alternate reality banner. And so what it does is it leads to like alternate banner, basically telling like, you know, the, the main Marvel Universe banner, right? Don't go out there, right? Like these, this is literally an army that's bred for the purpose of destroying people like you, right? Like they, they this, this is not like you running out there and dealing with like bullets and things like that. They specialize in this. And so what you end up getting is that once Banner shows up out there, it's just like this colossal army with this, these giant mech suits. You know what this reminds me of? In a lot of ways, it reminds me of like Days of Future Past, right? It looks very, very similar to Days of Future Past. This is one of the reasons why that story was so landmark when it came out and why it has such a strong legacy because so often whenever you look at alternate reality stories where essentially the superheroes have basically been killed off in some form or fashion, usually by the actions of the government itself, that it is some kind of Days of Future Past-esque scenario, right? The activation of some version of the Sentinel program. Sometimes the Sentinels become self-aware. Other times the Sentinels never deviate from their programming. They never become self-aware and they just operate based on the programming given to them by the federal government. But whatever it is, the funny thing about this is Banner tells his alternate reality counterpart, no, 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 right? I'm from a whole different playing field. Like I am not these gamma mutates that you see out there, right? These gamma irradi irradiated beings, just watch and learn my friend. I'm on a whole different level from these guys. Now, once he jumps out there and, and literally Ross is just like fire, right? Fire everything they have. Then it initially takes Banner by surprise, right? Like he didn't really believe what alternate Banner was telling him until he was being hit with all these lasers that are literally piercing his skin, right? Which is a very difficult task to achieve. But in a world full of gamma irradiated hulks, it was only a matter of time before these, before technology was developed that could overcome those hulks and by extension, overcome this one. But as you guys know, and seemingly one of the things that makes the main Marvel Universe version of the Incredible Hulk so unique is that the angrier he gets, the stronger he gets. And so as a result of this, literally Banner just like sets the whole, the whole engine system of the Incredible Hulk to stage four. Now remember, those of you guys who are kind of getting caught up here, that basically it's Banner controlling the mind of the Incredible Hulk. And by setting the engine to stage four, what he's basically doing is forcing the Incredible Hulk personality to experience like all these different horrors in these stages of combat, which in turn makes the Incredible Hulk personality angrier and it makes the Incredible Hulk's body stronger and more durable, which allows Banner to continue fighting in places that he normally wouldn't be able to fight. The thing about this is that by going to stage four, it basically activates a, a kind of hallucination of the Marvel zombies. So literally, while like the Hulk personality is just losing its mind attacking all these Marvel zombies, it amps him up more and more. His healing factor kicks in, he recovers almost instantaneously, and then like the strength boost comes. And in doing so, he starts laying waste to the forces of, of uh, Thunderbolt Ross, right? Like at that point, it's really Thunderbolt Ross realizing he never had a chance in the first place, right? Like it's just absolute madness here. And even this alternate reality version of Banner is like, my God, like what the hell have I unleashed, right? They have never seen anything like this in this alternate universe. They've never seen like a tried and true Incredible Hulk. And that's one of the things that Donny Cates really seems to be hitting at is that yes, you have different iterations of the Incredible Hulk from around the multiverse, but there only ever really seems to be one version of the Incredible Hulk that's as unique as this. Now, the reality is we know that's not necessarily the case, right? I mean, the what if story based on 
happened like World War Hulk, where basically Hulk ends up killing all the superheroes and becomes a Herald of Galactus. Like, that was basically the same Hulk that we were used to, who seemingly had all the same powers, right? So it's not that uncommon to see, but it seems to be a fairly rare thing. And so what you end up getting is actually General Thunderbolt Ross, who contacts this alternate banner and is just like, do something, right? Like, call this guy off. If you don't call this guy off, then I'm bringing out your, your star pupil, right? This stupid kid that you love so much, and we're going to send him down there. And so that's the crazy thing is because where, where Ross is like, you got 10 seconds, right? Banner like literally tries to talk him down. It's like, no, 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 no. Like, please don't do it. Please don't do it. He was like, call your monster off or the boy falls, right? The boy gets knocked down into this whole great big huge thing. And so it's one of those things where like this alternate reality Banner absolutely cares for this kid, right? But at the end of the day, he ends up succumbing to Thunderbolt Ross and then tells Bruce Banner that you have to stop this madness, right? You have to stop fighting against the forces of Ross. And like the whole time, Bruce Banner's like, what are you talking about? Why do I have to stop fighting? And he never really gets an answer. He doesn't shut off the engine, right? He doesn't, doesn't calm the Incredible Hulk down. That the Incredible Hulk persona keeps going crazy just like it always did. And so as a result of that, the countdown ends and Ross is just like, dunzo, and kicks the kid out of this whole thing. And so you have Bruce Banner talking to his alternate reality banner uh, counterpart and it's like, tell me what's going on. Like, what's happening here? And this alternate reality banner is like, okay, so here's the thing, right? Like, this kid was basically my star pupil, right? Like, he was, he was just, he was a research student of mine, right? He was like a son to me. His name was Peter and he was bitten by a spider that we had basically irradiated. Now, when that happens, right, in that moment, the forces of General Thunderbolt Ross retreat. They clear the battlefield. And when Bruce Banner asked the question, okay, this is probably stupid, but this irradiated spider that bit this kid Peter, what kind of radiation are we talking about here? And what it looks like is it was a gamma irradiated spider. Because what manifests here is one of the most badass depictions of Spider-Man ever, right? Like literally this kid lands here and he ends up transforming into what's basically a Hulk Spider-Man. It is awesome. Oh my God. God, he looks so good. This is why I love Donny Cates, man. The guy just pulls these crazy ass rabbits out of his ass, right? It's just, it's nuts the kind of stuff that he does. This guy's imagination is just bonkers. Okay, so getting back into Donny Cates' Hulk run, right? Picking up where we left off, uh, and we'll kind of explain what's going on to a degree as we go through this, as we usually do, just because of the fact that we're doing these like a month apart. We basically pick up in this alternate universe with this alternate reality version of Bruce Banner, and we pick up with this alternate reality version of General Thunderbolt Ross. Now, there is this really, really amazing monologue that the that Banner does, like the, the main Marvel Universe Banner, the Incredible Hulk does, as all this is happening. Because remember, he's basically uh, fighting this alternate reality version of Spider-Man who was also exposed to gamma radiation. So like Spider Hulk, essentially. And what he says here is he says he wanted to be so much more than this, right? He wanted to push the boundaries, explore the unknowable, that he wanted to discover and invent, to create. Instead, on this world, every world that has ever known the name Bruce Banner, the story is always the same. Like this alternate me, the banner of this world once said, I am become death again and again and again, the destroyer of worlds. Now, I love that quote. I don't know where, how many of you guys know where that's from, but it's it actually comes from a uh, from a Hindu scripture, but it was really, it really became a staple of pop culture because of Robert Oppenheimer. After the detonation of the atomic bomb, when it was experimented, you know, witnessing the first detonation um, in 1945, after the Manhattan Project, he said, I remember the line from the Hindu scripture, the Bhagavad Gita, Vishnu is trying to persuade the prince that he should do his duty and to impress him takes on his multi-armed form and says, now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I absolutely love that quote. I've always loved that quote, right? It's just one of my absolute favorite quotes when it comes to the, the history, just, just in general, right? It's just, it's an amazing quote, but nonetheless, right? This alternate reality version of Bruce is basically being pummeled by Thunderbolt Ross. Now remember, they kind of worked together to a degree, right? That Ross seemingly in this universe and virtually every other has never really liked Bruce Banner, but the, the, I guess maybe alliance between the two, despite it being tenuous, was predicated on the idea that in the attempt of this alternate reality version of Banner to solve the bio waste problem and accidentally creating all these different versions of, of Hulks, essentially, some of whom are grotesquely mutated, others are relatively normal in terms of their appearance, that 
in order to correct this mistake, they would basically send them through a wormhole and who knows where they would go. Now, one of the things Donnie Cates tells us is that ultimately we'll find out where they go to. <laughs> we'll find out where it is that they all end up at. But regardless, it's just this, this really, really cool moment because what Ross wants here in basically pummeling this alternate reality version of Banner is he wants to know what this Hulk is, where it came from and how to kill it. And that's the crazy thing is because this version of Hulk, this alternate reality Hulk represents this huge threat to this alternate version of Thunderbolt Ross because it could destabilize everything he's built. Now, remember, in terms of how the Incredible Hulk operates right now, it's the Incredible Hulk's strength that is basically motivated by the Incredible Hulk itself. That what you have here is you have Banner who controls the mind of the Incredible Hulk and that he basically forces the Incredible Hulk's psyche to face off against all these different threats. And as you guys know, the longer a fight goes on for and the more difficult it becomes for the Incredible Hulk to defeat a foe, the angrier the Incredible Hulk becomes. And the angrier the Hulk becomes, the stronger he becomes. So quite literally, Bruce Banner has turned the Incredible Hulk uh, persona into a source of power that he can manipulate, right? He can literally ramp it up by stages, ramp it down by stages, have him face off against all kinds of credible threats. And so the result of this is right now, they're at stage four. Basically, the Incredible Hulk persona is fighting Marvel zombies in his own mind. And because the Incredible Hulk cannot differentiate, right? It's basically a child. It doesn't know that what it's seeing is not real. It thinks it is. And so it's just pummeling everything it sees. And as the fight continues to go on, the Incredible Hulk persona gets angrier and angrier and gets stronger and stronger. And so because of this, again, Betty Ross has intermittently kind of appeared in the mind of Banner and just kind of talked to him occasionally. And one of the things that she says is she asks, like, what are you doing? Right? Like, you know, you're not going to kill that poor thing. And the response of Banner is, I mean, like, what are you talking about? And the answer that, that Betty offers is like, he's just a child, right? He can't help what he is. And that's when Banner gets a little irritated and is just kind of like, you know, what is this, right? Since when do you care so much about protecting these supposed children? Why is this so important to you? And that's when, when Betty's like, Bruce, I don't exist, right? I'm not a, I'm a manifestation of your own mind. But she says, I know what happens when you lock a child away and abuse it. When you take its freedoms away, its agency, it bottles all of that up, right? All of that fury, all of that rage. When you do that, Bruce, the child turns into what made it. You know this better than anyone. You were turned into what you are by your father, right? Like you hurt people. You did bad things to people, right? Like the Incredible Hulk persona is a manifestation of the abuse you experienced at the hands of your father, right? Rage given a physical form. And she says, now you have to ask yourself if you lock the Hulk away and you keep hurting it, keep making it angrier, making it bottle up all of that rage, when that child explodes, what will he turn into? And the response of Banner is, I don't know, but let's find out. And that's when he ramps it up to stage five in order to defeat this, you know, mutated version of Spider-Man. And at this point, now it's fighting gods. It's fighting Surtur and like Thor and Beta Ray Bill and like Loki and all these people, which again, makes the Hulk angrier and angrier. Now the Hulk is able to overcome this, uh, this, this, mutated spider, you know, spider Hulk, he's able to overcome him. But at that point, or at least uh, kind of get the fight to the point where spider, spider Hulk is on the ropes. But what you do here is you basically switch over to this alternate reality version of Banner. And it says like, I tried to tell you everything, right? I, I've told you everything I know, right? Like there's no conceivable way that I know of to kill this version of the Incredible Hulk. And that's when you end up having, uh, having Thunderbolt Ross who lays his chips on the, on the table, right? He tells the, tells the guys to leave and he basically reveals his hand. And what he says here is that in reality, uh, at the end of the day, when it came to like all these different versions of the Hulk that this alternate reality version of Banner had accidentally created, that General Thunderbolt Ross wasn't just getting rid of them indiscriminately, that what he was doing was actually weaponizing them, that the ones who were weaker, the ones who couldn't serve a useful purpose, they were all discarded. They were sent through the portal to end up wherever it was that they ended up at. But the reality is the ones who were stronger, the ones who could be used for warfare, right? That they were kept. And in fact, Reed Richards in this alternate universe had actually made it possible for Thunderbolt Ross to essentially control these versions of the Hulk. And then in turn, they've used them to fight wars, right? That one of the things that Thunderbolt Ross has said is that he had to use, you know, ordinance that's the equivalent to the GDP of multiple nations that have been conscripted or taken over by the US. So what this means or what this seems to indicate is that the geopolitical landscape is not the way that it is in the main Marvel universe. It's not the United States of America, Canada, Mexico, Russia, any of the number of countries that are in Europe, 
right China, that instead things seem to have changed drastically. And we don't necessarily know what, what continents or what nations the United States has taken over, but the United States has taken over a lot of them, right? They, they seem to control a huge part of the world. And the incredible hulks that were basically being taken by, uh, by Thunderbolt Ross that had accidentally been created by Banner, they were instrumental in making that happen. And so while it's not necessarily the fault of Banner, Thunderbolt Ross plays it off by saying, in a way, it is. Like you, sure, like all these incredible hulks, they were an accident created by you. It wasn't your intention. You were just trying to solve the bio waste problem, but you literally gave us weapons. And while I never told you before, I used them to win wars, right? I just kind of kept it hidden from you. And so that's the crazy thing is because what happens is that in the middle of all this, you have the fight going on between Hulk and, and you know, Spider Hulk in the actual real world, right? That's where that fight is taking place. But the reality is all these bombs are dropped by Thunderbolt Ross, right? And when that happens, it's not enough to kill Spider Hulk or anything, but it's certainly enough to basically destroy the visor of, uh, of Banner. And when that happens, like Banner is like literally the whole thing goes nuts, right? Like Banner's just kind of blown out of his seat and all that kind of stuff. And while it is a little weird because Banner is supposed like this is the physical body of the Hulk. So it's basically the, the, the psyche of Banner, the psyche of the incredible Hulk, basically, you know, kind of operating inside this body, uh, that Banner is actually overtaken by the psyche of Betty Ross. That the, the kind of physical representation we get here, at least as far as we can tell, is basically Banner just kind of being thrown out there. It's not really Banner being thrown into the physical real world. Instead, what it is, is it's actually Banner just being thrown out of control, right? That basically Betty Ross is taking over. That's kind of how that works, right? So those of you guys who are watching like Moon Knight right now, for example, you know how like the, the minds switch between like Steve Grant and Mark Spector? This is the equivalent of when like Mark Spector takes over and Steve Grant ends up going back there. But instead of Steve Grant like relinqu uh, relinquishing control, uh, Mark Spector just takes control. <laughs> That's basically how this is working right now to give you guys a better understanding of what's going on. Because I know that, like on the surface, just looking at it, it's like, wait a minute. Okay, so like does Banner physically exist? No, it's basically just the Betty Ross persona taking over the body of the Incredible Hulk and forcing the Bruce Banner persona into the background, right? And so because of this, what you also end up learning here is that this isn't actually Betty Ross. It looks like it's Betty Ross, but it's not actually Betty Ross, right? One of the things she says is that where Banner is begging, right? Like you have to help me here. The, the response she gives is like, look at you, right? Helpless, trapped at the mercy of forces and violence out of your control. Remind you of anybody. And, and ultimately she says, you never really listen, do you, right? I told you, Bruce, Betty isn't real. Betty's not here. And what she does is she ramps the engine up and basically takes it to stage six. And so now you have the Incredible Hulk persona facing off against demons, Mephisto, Dormammu, right? All these different guys. Now, here's kind of a funny caveat to this, right? Here's something that, that you may not have noticed. One of the things that Donnie Cates is doing is giving us a hierarchy of power in Marvel Comics. It's very easy to miss. It's very easy to not notice, but he's giving us a hierarchy of power that in essence, you have stage one, which is kind of a relatively small threat. But as the stages go up, the beings become more powerful. It wouldn't really make any sense to ramp the Incredible Hulk up to stage six and then like, here comes the Red Skull. It wouldn't really make any sense to do that. <laughs> and so Donnie Cates is in effect giving us a hierarchy of power in the Marvel Universe. I can guarantee you, people are going to reference this, right? You go and you look at like battle forms and different things like that, or you ask people, you know, in different forms, like who, you know, who's more powerful, you know, like uh, Odin or or like Dormammu, right? People are going to be like, well, I mean, according to Donnie Cates' in, you know, Hulk run, it looks like it's Dormammu because Dormammu was a stage six villain or a stage six power and Odin was stage five, you know, and, and that kind of a thing, right? But it's a cool little aside here. It's a, it's a smart little thing. And so in the end, one of the things that happens is that General Thunderbolt Ross reveals to uh, Bruce Banner, this alternate version of Bruce, that these bombs that he dropped are not bombs in the traditional sense. Instead, what they are here are basically a means of mutation. That what's happening is that inside each one of these canisters are basically people that had become, that had been mutated, even though unintentionally by Banner, but the ones that Thunderbolt Ross had kept. And that these, as, as Thunderbolt Ross refers to, uh, refers to them, are basically just like uh, abominations, right? Kind of like this alternate reality version of abomination here. And so it's nuts because these things are massive in size, right? They're absolutely huge in size. And so of course, this basically leads to Betty completely taking over the body of the Incredible Hulk, completely pushing Banner's persona out of the way. But in doing so, she says, but I'm proud of you, son. And that's where it seems to hit at this idea that this is potentially Brian Banner. Now, this is where things get a little murky because in Al Ewing's run, one of the things to remember in the Immortal Hulk is that it wasn't necessarily Brian Banner. It kind of was, but it was basically Brian Banner's spirit or essence that had been overtaken by the one below all and used to torment the Incredible Hulk. That's what that was. It wasn't actually Brian Banner himself. And so what this does is 
it builds on what we've seen both in Al Ewing's runs, a lot of runs that came before it, Bill Mantlo, Peter David, where basically the Brian Banner persona is kind of the, uh, the controlling aspect. Now, that's me guessing here, right? Just going on what's sort of happening in terms of words, that Brian Banner is the source of Bruce Banner's torment and seemingly the most powerful entity in his mind, the one thing that Banner just can't seem to overcome. But I could be entirely wrong here. This could very well be the, the mental persona of the Titan Hulk, right? Like, we don't know. We won't know until we get to the next issue. But ultimately, that this persona ends up ramping everything up, right? Like, right past stage 7 and, and right past stage 8, all the way to stage 9, which is basically just who really even knows what this stage looks like. Presumably, it's the Titan Hulk. But whatever it is, it literally leads to the Incredible Hulk just absolutely losing it and annihilating all these different abomination forces that are out there. And that's where it ends. So presumably, this is where Titan Hulk comes into play. And if it does, I can't wait to see how this plays out. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are back with Donny Cates Smashtronaut with the finale, and we finally get the Titan Hulk, the most powerful version of the Hulk that we've ever seen. Now, for those of you guys who want to get caught up, make sure you check the link in the description, or you can click on the card here in the video, which will take you to the Hulk playlist that will get you caught up on all this stuff. But the long and short of it is that the Incredible Hulk is basically here in an alternate reality and is facing off against these altered versions of the Hulk, basically, um, these accidentally created versions versions. But the thing about this is that, remember, Bruce Banner was the one controlling the body of the Hulk, and that the Incredible Hulk persona is in the engine room, basically serving as a source of power because of its anger, and that somehow an alternate personality, which seems to be Brian Banner, although Donny Cates hasn't necessarily confirmed it, has now seized control. So it's like if the Incredible Hulk body was being controlled by an evil personality, is basically what it is. Now, the way in which uh, Bruce Banner basically amped up the Incredible Hulk or brought him down in terms of like how much power he would need to face off against a particular threat was basically forcing the Incredible Hulk personality to fight different levels of villains that are out there. So at the baseline level is like the Incredible Hulk just walking along, right? And maybe fighting fighting some guy or, you know, fighting the Avengers or something like that in the real world. And so in the engine room, it would be these baseline villains, really, like nobody of any real significance. What we're seeing here is what happens when that's amped up all the way to 10. When basically Basically, it's the most amount of power that could be taken out of the Incredible Hulk, right? Like, literally pushing him to his to his highest level. Now, Donny Cates doesn't necessarily confirm this, but what he says here, or at least what this indicates, is if this is the most amount of strength the Incredible Hulk can possibly offer, basically pushing him to the limit, then it's way beyond anything we've ever seen. And the highest amount of power that we'd seen from the Incredible Hulk up to this point was Heart of the Monster. When he was so strong, he was actually breaking the dark dimension, the, the dimension of Dormammu, which at the time was ruled by his sister Umar, who literally showed up in the main Marvel Universe asking Doctor Strange for help because the Incredible Hulk just couldn't be stopped. I mean, it was crazy how powerful he was. Still one of the best stories ever. Again, that's in the playlist as well, if you guys want to get caught up on that. But the thing about this is that with this personality running the show, it's really just kind of offering this amazing meta commentary. Coming in the form of Betty Ross, albeit seemingly actually being somebody else, what we're told here is that it says everyone always says the same thing. That the Hulk is Bruce's identity, right? His alter ego. The embodiment of a scared little boy overwhelmed with impotent rage because of the abuse he endured when he was a little kid, blah, 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 yada, 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 right? She just kind of shuffles it off. And that's true, right? That's one of the best things about this is this Donny Cates kind of offering this meta commentary. Now, for those of you guys who don't know what this means, uh, as we're going through this, I'll kind of give you guys a little bit of a little bit of a background here. Although you do get an amazing moment where you basically have like when it's amped up to level 10, which according to Bruce Banner is basically theoretical. He doesn't even really know what would happen if that were the case, that basically it's the Hulk versus the entire Marvel Universe, which in, which includes the Living Tribunal, Thanos, and a version of Galactus who is the Hulk. Now, there's a reason behind that, and I'll explain that here in a second, because unless you're familiar with Galactus, you wouldn't know why Galactus looks like the Incredible Hulk, and even this personality doesn't know, which is, uh, which is a really, really cool concept. So the thing about this is that when it comes to uh, the Incredible Hulk mythos, most people out here Whenever they go and they buy an Incredible Hulk comic book and they read an Incredible Hulk comic book, what they want to see is the Incredible Hulk just smashing people. That's what they want to see. <laughs> they want to see the Incredible Hulk fighting really powerful people and beating them up and just tearing things up because that's what the Hulk is known for. Now, people who want a more like character centric run, that was the old Bill Mantlo and Peter David stuff. Greg Pak focused on that 
to a degree, but it was more expanding the Incredible Hulk mythos and then focusing on like the character of the Hulk insofar as it related to like Hero Kala and Scar, the sons he didn't know he had, which were really, really cool. And there were a few other things that went in there, but in terms of like a character deconstruction of the Hulk, what's being referenced here in terms of the fact that like the Incredible Hulk personality is the physical manifestation of just all the rage that Bruce Banner experienced at the hands of his father's abuse, that's all Bill Mantlo and Peter David. It was initially started by Bill Mantlo back in the day, but he took off before he could finish, and then Peter David continued it on. And that's why, one, a lot of people say the two go hand in hand, that when it comes to that era of The Incredible Hulk, is Bill Mantlo and Peter David together. And two, a lot of people say that Peter David's run of The Incredible Hulk is one of the most important runs. It's not the most interesting run, especially when you compare it to something like Greg Pak, which had a lot more action and a lot more character development. But in terms of everything Greg Pak did, that was built on the shoulders of Peter David. So Peter David's run is probably one of the most significant runs, if for no other reason than the fact that it just sort of changed the Hulk from like the old Stanley Jack Kirby days where he's just like, you know, a monster running around with the mind of a child and like beating things up and like fighting General Thunderbolt Ross and his army and so on and so forth, especially if you look at the Roy Thomas era as well. And it changed him into like, there's actually more to the Incredible Hulk than we initially thought. Now, as far as this whole scenario goes, when it comes to like why uh, Galactus looks like the Incredible Hulk, I mean, technically it is the Incredible Hulk versus Galactus, the Living Tribunal, and the Phoenix Force. It is here in the engine room. But the reason why is something that was established in a story called The Trial of Reed Richards. And we've talked about this before, but basically that set up the idea that Galactus does not actually have a physical form anymore. He did, back when he was Galen, before his universe, before the multiverse was destroyed. And then he re-emerged after merging with that universe's version of Eternity, essentially, when he was reborn into the new universe as Galactus. Uh, he had a human form back when he was initially just what you would call a human or a sentient being. But when he was reborn as Galactus, he's pure energy. And so if you saw him as he really is, it would just be a swirling mass of energy inside of a giant purple suit. And there's one point where Odin like headbutts Galactus and shatters his helmet, uh, which I, I'm pretty sure we did a video on that. And that in turn, you actually see Galactus in what looks like his human form. But the reality here is it's how an Asgardian would see him. Because in the trial of Reed Richards, what they set up and what they stated is that Galactus is a mirror for for whatever race or whatever being sees him. So if you are a scroll and you see Galactus, he will look like a scroll. If you are a Kree, he'll look like a Kree. If you're a human, he'll look human. And so if you're an Asgardian, he'll probably look like an Asgardian, which is why in this instance, the Incredible Hulk sees Galactus and he sees an Incredible Hulk. So, so the, the thing about this and what's really cool is the Hulk literally amps up and starts attacking everything, right? Starts attacking all of them. Now, the funny thing about this is during this whole, this whole situation, the entire monologue offered by this Betty Brandt, we can call her Betty Brandt, right? This Betty Brandt-esque person, which is most likely Brian Banner, that literally it says, over the years, there've been so many Hulks, gray ones, red ones, blue ones, Wolverine ones, which is actually called Weapon H, and he was not that interesting. Uh, she says, it seems to me that, well, everyone gets to have a Hulk these days. Bruce has a Hulk, Rick Jones had a Hulk, General Thunderbolt Ross had a Hulk, Jennifer Walters even had a Hulk. And she said, hell, even God has a Hulk, which is cool to see Donnie Cates referencing the Al Ewing run, where we basically learned that the, the one below all is what happens when God hulks out. And so she's like, it's really unfair, isn't it? Like, why can't the Hulk have a Hulk? Now, this, and this gives us two things. One is a retcon that everyone's glad happened, and two is a new version of the Hulk. And so what we end up getting, like, as this fight goes on, technically, the Betty Ross persona is in the mind of the Incredible Hulk. In the real world, the Incredible Hulk is fighting in this alternate reality against, like, all these different, just grotesque and mutilated versions of the Hulk. Remember, in this alternate universe, there was an effort to basically utilize gamma energy as a source of renewable energy. Things went wrong, and instead of becoming a renewable energy source, it ended up mutating a whole host of the world's population into these different versions of the Hulk. And that's what the Incredible Hulk's fighting now in the real world. So that's why I say it's something to kind of keep in mind. Donny Cates does it a little finicky, right? He does it a little, a little weird. But essentially, anytime you see somebody that looks like they're in a cockpit, they're in the mind of the Incredible Hulk. When you see the version of the Incredible Hulk that looks like a robot, kind of, that's basically him in the real world. So just something to keep in mind here. The thing about this is that as this fight goes on, because the Hulk is being so readily overpowered and quite literally being slapped around, what it ends up doing is the Incredible Hulk himself hulks out. Now, 
This is something Marvel had done before, and it was ass. So in the story of Axis, basically the Incredible Hulk hulked out into basically Claw, which was the Incredible Hulk spelled backwards. It was a terrible idea, uh, ridiculously dumb. And so what we got instead of that was this, like Donny Cage just being like, this is what happens when the Hulk hulks out. Uh, he ends up becoming the Titan Hulk, which is nuts because he literally looks part machine. Like it's just ridiculously OP, which is absolutely amazing. I love this. I mean, dude, the guy's just spewing energy everywhere. But this is why I say, this is what it looks like. This is seemingly the most powerful version of the Incredible Hulk that we've ever seen. Now, there, there are huge differences between this version of the Hulk and like Heart of the Monster. In looking at these two, you kind of have to come from a feats perspective. And in terms of like what each one is capable of, we saw what the Heart of the Monster Hulk was able to do. I mean, again, shattering and like breaking apart the dimension of one of the most powerful magic wielders in existence, which depending on who's writing the story, dwarfs the power of Doctor Strange. That is crazy. Like literally them having to take off from their dimension and ask Doctor Strange for help to deal with that version of the Incredible Hulk. So we're not really seeing those same levels of feats. Now, I would be curious to see what happens if the Titan Hulk ends up in the Dark Dimension again and how that unfolds. It would be pretty wild and it would be pretty cool. But this is what happens when the Incredible Hulk's just strength, rage, anger, all that kind of stuff, and really fear take hold and is pushed to the absolute limit. We just get this massively grotesque, huge thing right and literally what what they're saying is they're like i've never seen anything like this before it's like 30 feet tall like this thing is enormous right i mean he's just huge like it's just it's it's amazing <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely love this. So again, here in the real world, in this alternate reality, you have General Thunderbolt Ross and you have this alternate reality version of Bruce Banner. And this alternate version of Bruce was in a lot of ways kind of subservient to General Thunderbolt Ross, but only in so far as this alternate reality version of Bruce was basically a coward, wrecked by guilt and fear and so on and so forth. And so the reality here is Thunderbolt Ross basically ends up getting on a getting on the radio and calling in like a gamma bomb detonation. Now, the way this works, seemingly what would happen Happen here is somehow gamma radiation has been altered by General Thunderbolt Ross to where it's more akin to like a nuclear explosion, right? Enough that it would just eradicate everything here. And in truth, usually when it comes to like a nuclear bomb or something like that, it's a combination of heat and force and radiation, right? I mean, if you're at ground zero when a nuclear warhead goes off or a nuclear bomb detonates, which technically it doesn't detonate on the ground, it detonates a little into the a little above ground, uh, just to maximize the area of destruction. I mean, you would be incinerated by the heat immediately. And assuming you weren't incinerated by the heat, if you're close enough to the blast, I mean, you'd probably be knocked into a building and just, just killed that way, right? Your skull would be crushed by the impact. But assuming that doesn't happen, the radiation sickness would probably kill you as well, right? I mean, there's a lot of ways to die as a result of a nuclear bomb going off. But like, that really seems to be what it is here, right? It would just be like, couldn't like literally just heat and pressure is basically what General Thunderbolt Ross is banking on. Whether or not it would work, we don't know. I mean, there have literally been instances where like the Incredible Hulk, who's just kind of angry, has been able to withstand the power of a nuclear bomb. Even Maestro, right? Like literally Maestro Hulk absorbed the radiation that came from nuclear bombs. So we've seen different variations of the Hulk over the years who could easily withstand a nuclear explosion. How a gamma, a weaponized gamma explosion would impact the Hulk, I don't entirely know. I mean, literally the Hulk is living gamma radiation. My assumption would be that he would just absorb it. But the reality here and the point that this alternate version of Bruce Banner brings up is that Thunderbolt Ross can't do that. Like it's a terrible thing to do because if he he did, thousands of people would die. Because while we don't see them because they're not the main focus here, they're, there's basically a populated area, right? It's not overly populated and they kind of seem to be off out there and a little bit of a distance, but the, the explosion radius would be high enough or would be wide enough that it would kill so many innocent people. And that in turn, Thunderbolt Ross just kind of like overpowering or really just sort of directing Bruce Banner is like, no, like I don't care. In the end, like we'll both end up killing thousands of people. And he says, because remember, you're the reason why these different versions of the Hulk exist in the first place, and you're the one that brought this alternate Hulk here. So really, this is all your fault. Now, the reality here is as Thunderbolt Ross, to a degree, trying to assuage his guilty conscience, if he even has one, and just trying to bring Bruce Banner down with him. But where this version of Bruce is kind of a depiction of what would happen if Bruce Banner just never grew any balls, he never became the Incredible Hulk, and was never like an enemy of Thunderbolt Ross insofar as he was able to overpower him, likely humiliate him a few times, that the only thing he really can do is muster up what courage he has, and he in turn 
attacks Thunderbolt Ross and is like, no, I'm not going to let you kill thousands of people. Now, while, you know, within the context of this particular story, it doesn't seem significant, or at least this particular video, over the course of the videos that we've covered, it's a huge moment because this alternate reality version of Bruce was constantly racked by guilt and constantly felt like he was making terrible mistakes. And even then, he didn't realize that where he was basically sending all these different uh, versions of the Hulk that they caught across their world into the ether, right, into some into some portal somewhere with no clue where they went to, that what was really going on is that he was sending the ones out there that General Thunderbolt Ross didn't want. That what Thunderbolt Ross was doing was going around and grabbing those different versions of the Hulk that he could use, that were that he thought were weaponized. So in reality, he was, or at least by his own imagination, kind of using, using his own mind, feeding into his own guilt, he was the reason why all these different abominized versions of the Hulk were continuing to live these terrible existences under the servitude of General Thunderbolt Ross because he didn't know. But had he not done what he'd done in creating the Gamma Detonation, trying to create some kind of renewable energy, they never would have been left to that fate in the first place. So the screwed up world in which Bruce Banner lives here, he largely takes as being his fault. Him attacking Thunderbolt Ross, overpowering him, pointing that gun at him and saying, no, like you're not going to kill anybody anymore. This is seemingly him overcoming that guilt and accepting that not everything bad that's going on now is his fault, right? That like there are some things out there that are just a result of the fact that people are dicks, right? Like Gen General Thunderbolt Ross is just a terrible person who is doing terrible things. And despite what Thunderbolt Ross said, it was not the fault of Bruce Banner. Now, the other part of this is that in the mindscape of the Incredible Hulk, Bruce Banner kind of claws his way back into to the Incredible Hulk's mind, more or less, where he was just kind of out there. Basically, it was a it was an in comic representation of the fact that like the Bruce Banner persona was forced to take a back seat. So ultimately, of course, with him coming back in, we do get this version of Betty Ross, this person which seemingly kind of alters and kind of changes and takes on this different form. Again, we don't know exactly what this is, but I would go as far as to say, if the Titan Hulk is what happens when the Hulk hulks out, that this is the mental representation of what the Titan Hulk looks like. We don't know that for sure. We're not 100% certain, but in the end, there's this kind of discussion where literally the personality is like, you have no power here, Banner, right? Like you are weak, you are pathetic. You cannot take control. You cannot wrestle control of the body away from me. And the response of, of Banner is, I know, but he has the power to do it. And in doing so, flips the switch, like literally hits the emergency switch and allows the Incredible Hulk persona to come in. Now, here's the thing. It's amazing the way this is drawn, right? Like literally the doors just half open and like the Incredible Hulk persona is just there. And it's like the head of Galactus is behind him and he looks pissed and he comes smashing in here. So what you're seeing here right now is basically a battle of personalities, right? It's the Incredible Hulk personality versus the Bruce Banner personality versus whatever this new alternate personality is, which is seemingly the personality of the Titan Hulk. I would go as far as to say that was the case. But the way this is drawn can get really, really hairy and a little bit confusing. And so in essence, what happens here is that in the mind of the Incredible Hulk, right, where you basically have the Bruce Banner personality, the Titan Hulk personality, and the Incredible Hulk personality, the Incredible Hulk personality is able to beat back the Titan Hulk personality. In the real world, the Titan Hulk itself is literally just unbridled energy that it just can't control. And so because it has all this energy and because it doesn't know how to control all this energy, like this is seemingly just a mindless thing. It literally just roars. We never really hear it speak or anything like that. That in the end, all this energy just kind of explodes in a massive explosion, right? It just goes off, right? It literally just blows up. And so what you have here, at least momentarily, is essentially a reunification of personalities. The Titan Hulk personality has been beat back to wherever it came from. We don't really know where it came from, but presumably it just resides down there in the mindscape somewhere. And that as a result of the destruction of the quote unquote real world Titan Hulk, uh, now it's basically just the Incredible Hulk back in its normal form. And so at this point, Banner basically runs back into the cockpit, right? The mind of the Incredible Hulk. And in doing so, reseizes control. And as that goes on, of course, this gamma bomb is falling and it is gonna, it's gonna cost so much life. And so what ends up happening is there's a conversation between alternate reality Banner and the Incredible Hulk Banner, right? Banner one, Banner two, <laughs> Banner three. But you end up having like this, <laughs> this conversation between these where alternate reality Banner is like, look, this gamma bomb's falling 
you have to do something, right? Like I have an idea. And so, you know, Prime Banner, we can call him that, Banner from the main Marvel Universe, is like, then what do you want me to do? And Alternate Banner's like, I'm opening a portal. And basically that bomb is gonna come through that portal and it's gonna land here, right? It's gonna end up here where I am. But in the end, it's the rightful thing to do. I've caused nothing but just death and destruction and just horrible things. Uh, I wouldn't go, I mean, he doesn't go as far as to say like, it's the fate that awaits me. But he says like, I really hope that you don't end up like me. I really hope that you don't end up in this place where you're basically like this kind of horrible, terrible villain. What you have here in the form of the Incredible Hulk is quite literally a gift. Use it, right? Like use it as a gift, treat it with respect, but use it to do good things. Now, this is actually a really, really cool concept because what this does is it gives us perspective. That the only real perspective we have when it comes to the Incredible Hulk is what we've seen over the course of Marvel Comics and potentially some alternate realities. And unless you're looking at like Warren Ellis's Marvel The End, you don't really see a whole lot of like totally screwed up, twisted up versions of the Incredible Hulk. But that's all this alternate reality banner knows are just twisted, screwed up versions of the Hulk. And so as a result of this, once that bomb goes through, and of course it ends up detonating, that the portal is reopened and Banner, or at least the Incredible Hulk anyway, travels through it to wherever his destination ends up taking him next. He has no clue where it is that he's gonna end up going. All he knows is that literally, at the moment, the hammer of All Father Thor, which was recently reassembled by Angela and the Angels of Heaven, is making its way towards the Hulk. So in essence, what we're apparently going to see here, which makes perfect sense because literally it's the 60th anniversary of the Incredible Hulk and Thor fighting for the first time, that what we're gonna end up getting is All Father Thor against probably the Titan Hulk, which I am ridiculously excited to see. So Titan Hulk fights an army of 500 World Breaker Hulks in this video, and it's amazing. Check this out. So what this does is this initially picks up with Bruce Banner in control of Starship Hulk. Now, people who have no idea what's going on in the Incredible Hulk mythos right now are probably like, what? <laughs> Explain this to me, man. So here's what's happening right now. In years past, you had the Incredible Hulk who turned into Bruce Banner and Bruce Banner who turned into the Incredible Hulk. The angrier the Incredible Hulk got, the stronger he became. What's been going on recently and we didn't know how Bruce Banner did it, but we are gonna find out in this video. What Bruce Banner managed to do was basically take control of the Incredible Hulk's body and then have the Incredible Hulk persona operate as a kind of engine for his own body. So literally what Bruce Banner does is he just bombards the Incredible Hulk personality with an endless onslaught of increasingly powerful characters. It starts off with somebody like Wolverine and goes all the way up to people like Thanos. They're all just psychic projections, but the Hulk personality doesn't know that. And so it just continues to fight over and over and over and over again. And because the Incredible Hulk gets stronger, the angry he gets by increasing the difficulty of the villains that the Hulk personality has to fight. That's how Banner controls how strong the Incredible Hulk gets to be, or at least the body gets to be. It's pretty cool. But of course, with him in control of Starship Hulk, he basically crash lands on a world that he's not familiar with because at this point in time, the Incredible Hulk, or really Banner, is traversing the multiverse. He's literally exploring the whole multiverse. We'll make sense of all of that as we go through this video, but in arriving on this world, he doesn't recognize anything here. The only thing he sees that he even just seems remotely recognizable. It's just this giant citadel that's been built and seemingly it's been built in his honor because there's just a giant statue of the Incredible Hulk. Now, of course, he's almost immediately set upon by just these crazy monstrous looking Hulk type things that are called the Grey, but then he's almost immediately rescued by a chick named Monolith. Now we'll learn more about her because she's incredibly important here, but what she does is she explains what's going on in this alternate reality that Bruce Banner's in. And what she says is that at some point along the line, a just whole bunch of hulks suddenly arrived on this world. They literally fell through a portal and arrived on this world and that they did what hulks do. They just started smashing things. They were smashing the world to such a degree that they terraformed it. They terraformed a planet through smashing it. And that's going to be one of the craziest things because every single one of these hulks are all world breaker level. But of course, as they're smashing and basically terraforming this world, as time progresses, the exceedingly violent nature 
nature of these original hulks begins to go away. And what they end up doing is forming a more organized and structured society. Now, the other part of this seems to be that with the loss of their violent nature, their gamma radiation almost seems to kind of dissipate in the sense that they do have enough gamma to basically maintain their forms, some level of their strength, but by and large, they're just kind of really strong guys and that's it. But then like out of nowhere, the sun seemingly explodes and there's just like this giant vestige of the original Hulk, right? The main Hulk. And he just starts blasting them, like covering them all with gamma radiation. Now that's how Monolith describes it. What's actually really going on here is it looks like the arrival of this original Hulk kind of reawakens all the gamma radiation inside their bodies and turns them back into their exceedingly strong selves, basically sends them back into their world breaker forms. And so looking at the original Hulk or the main Hulk as kind of the person that returned them to glory, they built the whole statue and everything. And so while Monolith doesn't really know the significance of where all the original Hulks came from by passing through a portal or seeing a vestige of the main Hulk in the sky, we do know all that stuff. And this was all based on the previous story arc, which you'll find a link to in the comments section. Make sure you guys check for a pinned comment that'll take you to that video. But the way the previous storyline played out is that when Bruce Banner first entered into the multiverse, he encountered an alternate reality version of himself. And that alternate Bruce, under the direction of that universe's version of Thunderbolt Ross, was basically trying to create an army of Hulks. Those who were considered to be failures or castoffs were literally just sent through a wormhole and no one knew where they went to. They were just out of sight, out of mind, and that was basically it. Now everything popped off and we saw the Titan Hulk for the first time, which we'll talk about in this video and so on and so forth, but that's where they originally came from. What is important here is that Monolith brings Hulk basically to all the other Hulks in this city and kind of presents him as sort of the original, right? Like the one they all champion as the person that gave them all their gamma radiation, right? Like the Hulk above all Hulks, if you want to call him that, right? The prime Hulk. And so they see him very much as kind of a champion of the people. More so than that, what they also do is they bring him into something called the God Ball Games. Now, this is just an indication of how strong these different Hulks are, right? This planet has three rings of rocks around it in the same way that Saturn has rings, right? So what these Hulks do is they jump to a neighboring world and they smash the world, right? They literally just beat it and they hammer it all the way down to the point that it's as close as far as the atomic structure of everything that it can possibly get, right? There's no way to compact this core any further. And when they have that, they call it a God Ball. They bring the God Ball back to Hulk Planet, which is what this place is called. Then they use it as a game. They throw it at the rocks and whoever destroys the most rocks wins. The idea of breaking a world is now just a game of sport. Breaking worlds is just what they do for fun. And it's just nuts, right? It's just a whole different level of strength. And so of course, basically the Incredible Hulk participates in the whole thing. He's just like, sure, why not grab the giant core of a planet that's been condensed down to virtually nothing and start throwing it into things for sport and for fun. Why not be a part of this? Now, seemingly the God Ball games are just interrupted out of nowhere by a group that's referred to as the Alternative Universe Timeline Hazard Operations Response and Intervention Team, which if you've put those acronyms together correctly, spells authority. Now, is it the authority from DC Comics? No, but it's absolutely a pastiche on the team. It's basically just Donny Cates and Marvel Comics making fun of the authority. They're over the top, they present themselves with this grand level of authority that none of them have. And of course, they're basically going after the Hulk because the Hulk had basically destroyed the previous version of authority as he was flying through the multiverse. Now, of course, at this point, Monolith chimes in and says, well, actually what was happening is the Hulk was sleeping, didn't really know what he was doing. Your guys just got in his way. And with the Hulk being as strong as he is, he plowed through your entire team. So that's really the only reason why this happened. Now, of course, the other thing that ended up happening is that the Hulk himself, along with a guy named Pave, who's another one of the Hulks here is actually just transported to a different world, which they proceed to smash and create another God Ball out of. But the authority is being here is really more of just kind of a goofy moment. It's just a silly moment. I just thought it'd be a funny thing to reference. Otherwise, we would have normally just skipped over it. But of course, with like the Hulk himself returning alongside Pave, as well as having the God Ball, they continue on with the grand games themselves, completely and blissfully unaware of the fact that the Hulk personality inside the Incredible Hulk body is starting to become disillusioned. And the Titan Hulk is 
starting to manifest again. Now, here is where things get a little murky when it comes to the nature of the Titan Hulk. When the Titan Hulk first manifested in Marvel Comics, it manifested as a personality inside the mind of the Incredible Hulk itself, meaning you had Bruce Banner's personality, you had the Hulk's personality, then you had another that showed up in the form of Betty Ross. Now, we knew right off the bat it was not Betty Ross, and even within the story, Bruce Banner knew it wasn't Betty Ross, but we didn't really know what it was. What ends up happening is that over the course of this story, that personality starts to appear as Brian Banner, the abusive father of Bruce Banner. But do not be fooled by the appearance that the Titan Hulk takes, that when it does appear to the Hulk personality, it shows up as almost kind of like a Shadow King type entity, right? Very malevolent, it's difficult to make out its exact form, it's very dark, very scary, very murky, that kind of a thing, spouting stuff like, your soul belongs to me, your mind belongs to me, it's only a matter of time before I take over, yada yada yada, all the kind of stuff you expect to see. And even when the Hulk personality goes to attack the Titan Hulk persona, the Titan Hulk persona just shuts it down, right? I mean, just easily overtakes that version of the Hulk like that. I mean, it's not even a contest. And in fact, we'll see just how powerful this guy is because it's next level. But one of the things to know is that with the Titan Hulk personality basically amping up and beginning to seize control, we've only ever seen glimpses of how powerful the Titan Hulk is. And this video, we'll find out just what this dude is capable of. Now, the other part of this is that once the Titan Hulk persona does take hold, Stephen Strange actually picks up on it. Now, here's the thing about this. Yes, within Marvel Comics, those of you guys who are reading, Stephen Strange is technically dead. This story takes place after the death and return of Stephen Strange. Why? Because it's comic books and nothing stays changed forever. And so with Titan Hulk taking control of everything, Doctor Strange actually ends up getting involved. But the reason he gets involved is not for the reason that you think. And so what this does is this leads to the Titan Hulk actually initiating a series of enemies against the Hulk personality under the belief that in doing so, the Hulk personality will just face off against this endless horde of enemies, grow more and more powerful, and then when that time comes, basically amp himself up and allow the Titan Hulk to take over, right? Allow the Titan Hulk to seize control and then manifest in a physical form. The problem with this is that Bruce Banner and the Hulk personality are actually meditating together, which is something that they've done over the course of Donny Cates' run so far. They literally sit down, meditate, and they don't allow anything to bother them. And so for the most part, all these threats that literally keep being thrown against the Hulk, none of them seem to have any bearing whatsoever. Even when you have like a manifestation of the Phoenix, Thanos, Galactus, none of it seems to really impact the Hulk on a meaningful level. But at the end of the day, the Titan Hulk pushes things to the absolute limit and literally amps up the Incredible Hulk to the max level, the highest level he possibly can, and just explodes. And that's the nature of the Titan Hulk. The Titan Hulk is the answer to the question, when Bruce Banner gets pushed to his limits, he becomes the Incredible Hulk. What happens when the Hulk hulks out? you get the Titan Hulk. It's a pretty awesome concept because when that happens, the Titan Hulk is now in full control. Now, jumping to Doctor Strange, this is the reason why he's getting involved in the first place. So while we didn't initially know how it was that Banner was able to take over the mind of the Hulk and then force the Hulk personality to basically become the engine system, where we didn't know how he was able to turn the Incredible Hulk body into basically a vessel that could traverse the multiverse without being destroyed by the pressures of just space time and all that kind of stuff, we end up finding out that Bruce Banner had previously met with Doctor Strange. And Doctor Strange had actually showed him how to do that, right? He had shown him how to take over the body or at least the mind of the Hulk, how to seize control for himself. And then after learning how to do that, that what Banner had done is he had actually taken over one of MODOK's tech facilities and then started imbuing himself with the technology necessary to be able to traverse the spaceways, right? To travel the multiverse. So that's how all this seemingly came to where it is right now. Now, of course, when Stephen Strange realizes what's going on, he ends up sending his astral force into the multiverse in order to find uh, Bruce Banner on Hulk planet and then find a way to bring the entire conflict to an end because he kind of sees himself as being responsible for all of this. But here's the crazy thing about it. With Titan Hulk manifesting and with all these different World Breaker Hulks here on this world, they didn't know what they were getting into, right? They weren't necessarily goading the existence of the Titan Hulk. And if anything, what they were actually trying to do was get rid of the Bruce Banner personality. It was one of the main goals of Monolith and like Pave and any of them they saw the Hulk as the true personality of Banner and the Banner personality had to be eliminated. And so by working to get rid of like all the implants in the Hulk body, getting rid of the technological advancements and so on, and just turning him into a more pure version of the Hulk. Well, I wouldn't go as far as to say they're the reason why
why Titan manifested in the first place, I would go so far as to say they have no idea what they're dealing with here. Because as soon as Titan Hulk shows up, Monolith sends all of her forces after Titan. And when she does, they all get wrecked. Not even in hell would you see a massacre like this. To say they get wrecked is just an understatement, right? I don't know what word can adequately be used to illustrate what's going on here, but these guys never stood a chance in the first place. Any attack they launch against Titan Hulk is met with virtually no impact whatsoever. He doesn't even really feel anything. While Doctor Strange astral form does show up, it does basically step into the mind of Bruce Banner and try to fight the personality of the Titan Hulk, while the Worldbreaker Hulks try to fight the physical form of the Titan Hulk. None of it's helping. None of it makes any difference whatsoever. Literally, the Stephen Strange persona is blown out of the mind of Titan Hulk, and then in turn, the Titan Hulk turns his attention to these 500 Worldbreaker Hulks and just starts sucking all the gamma radiation right out of them, amping himself up even more and making himself more and more powerful. So much so that what Monolith does is she tells all the other Worldbreaker Hulks that are left to get out of there while they can, right? Evacuate, leave, lest they die. And so that's when Stephen Strange realizes what's actually actually going on here. What he does is he jumps back to his citadel, he grabs an orb and then brings it back to this alternate universe with his astral form and then he presents the orb and the person who emerges from it is Despair. Now Despair is a ridiculously powerful entity in Marvel Comics and is one of the most powerful fear lords to ever exist in the history of Marvel. I mean this guy's right up there with beings like Nightmare, the Dweller in Darkness, so on and so forth. What we end up finding out here is that for reasons that are never true Truly revealed when Bruce Banner met with Stephen Strange to learn how to control the Mindscape, it was never Stephen Strange that he actually met with. It was Despair masquerading as Stephen Strange, which is a crazy revelation because again, Despair only answers to some of the most powerful beings in existence, which seems to indicate there are forces out there within the multiverse that are of exceedingly high levels of power that have a vested interest in seeing the Titan Hulk personality run a complete and total rampage across the multiverse which basically seems to happen because when the attempts by Despair and Stephen Strange are implemented to contain and control the Titan Hulk, it's too late. And Titan Hulk is seizing control of everything. He's going to eradicate the world. He's going to destroy every world in the vicinity in this immediate solar system, spread to the galaxy, the universe, and even the multiverse. And there's seemingly nothing anybody can do to stop it. What's going on guys, this is Rob and we are getting the conclusion of Titan Hulk along with the origin of his character, which is really, really cool. So what this does here is this initially picks up in the mind of Bruce Banner with a little bit of taunting from despair, right? Remember, because of the fact that the Titan Hulk basically originates in the mind of Banner, when Doctor Strange got involved, his physical form is on his way to Planet Hulk. His spiritual form is in the mind of Banner, right? So he's just there trying to get rid of the Titan Hulk the best he can. The problem is he ends up encountering the Fear Lord Despair. But the thing about Despair is he's ridiculously OP. And in recent years, he was easily defeated by Doctor Strange in a way that normally shouldn't have been done. But what Despair does is he actually gives us this kind of origin of the Titan Hulk in telling us that what had happened is that somewhere along the line, a green door manifested to Despair. Now, anybody who's familiar with the Hulk mythos knows the significance of the green door, but that's that really comes from Al Ewing's run. So for those of you guys who aren't really familiar with that, and again, I'll have a link to the Hulk playlist from Al Ewing down in the comment section. But when it came to the Green Door, the way this worked is that in years past, you just had people who became different versions of the Hulk. Jennifer Walters became Incredible Hulk, Doc Samson became Doc Green, Bruce Banner became the Incredible Hulk, and so on and so forth. But what Al Ewing did is he introduced the idea of the Green Door, that in effect, whenever a person with gamma radiation in their body and they are a Hulk, whenever they die, a green door opens and they can be reborn. They can basically come back to life. It's a roundabout way for immortality. Now we ended up learning that the origin of the green door actually came from the one below all, who was basically an answer to the question, what happens when the one above all hulks out? It was a pretty insane revelation at the end of that story, right? Like the god of the Marvel multiverse has a hulk form and it's the one below all. It was pretty dope. But what Despair says is that it was presented with a kind of power or at least a little semblance of power by this 
this being. Now, what Despair says is that this little nugget it was given that comes with the form of a red ball, that it was only a small form or a small fraction of this being's power, that it had an astronomical amount of power. Now, by all standards of measurement, it was the one below all that gave this power to Despair. And anybody who knows anything about our coverage of Al Ewing's Hulk will tell you guys, the one below all is immensely powerful. I mean, there was literally a point in the story where Al Ewing showed us what would happen in the future when the one below all seized control of the Hulk, that it basically destroys the whole multiverse, it's reborn into the new multiverse after killing Franklin Richards and Galactus, and then destroys the next multiverse. That it would just wipe these things out continually until the end of time. It was a really awesome revelation. But because of the power of the one below all, even just a fraction of it, that despair was overwhelmed by it, right? Just like, God, this is insane. And in fact, what was instructed of despair is that he was to take this little fraction of what seems to be the one below all's power and place it inside the mind of Banner. And that's where the Titan Hulk comes from. It's an external power source that is slowly manifested and kind of gained sentience over the years. And that's why we were never really given a definitive explanation of where the Titan Hulk came from. It's not some alternate personality of Bruce Banner. It's not some long lost aspect of his anger and rage that he never quite dealt with. It's a foreign body, right? It's like having some kind of illness in his body, a kind of cancer that's just been growing over time and manifests in the form of the Titan Hulk. Now, what this does here is it basically leads to, again, this revelation that Stephen Strange's physical form is on its way, but with his spiritual form basically overtaken by the combined power of despair as well as the Titan Hulk persona, that what this does is it actually leads to the body and the mind of Stephen Strange merging, their power is completely reunified, and then in turn, they're able to cast off the power of despair and effectively lock him away. So the only thing, the only major issue that we have left here is the Titan Hulk itself, right? This physical manifestation in the real world. And this guy is laying waste to everything, right? Like even Stephen Strange isn't fully sure what to do because the level of power that the Titan Hulk possesses here is astronomical. And if it really is a Hulk powered by the one below all, then there really isn't anything that can be done here. But as this whole conflict is going on, Monolith is doing her best to hold off the power of the Titan Hulk. But for Monolith's part, one of the revelations that comes out here is that in her fight against Titan Hulk, that where it initially looked like she was beating on him as best she could, she was just kind of doing what Hulks do, which is physically attacking him, blasting him with her staff and magical energy and so on. What she's actually been doing this whole time was siphoning off his power, was siphoning the power away from Titan Hulk, and it diminishes his capabilities. He's not nearly as capable as he was, but this is where the miscalculation of Monolith comes into play. That she quite literally siphons his power off and then blasts him with it in the hopes that it'll destroy him, and it sends him flying. Of course, now when that happens, the other Hulks who were here, who Titan Hulk just absolutely demolished with the greatest of ease, that what happens is they approach her and they basically tell her like, you've saved us, everything's okay. And her response is, no, I haven't. I haven't saved anything. Like it was my miscalculation. I absorbed his energy and I blasted him with his own energy, hoping it would destroy him and it didn't. He's absorbing it all, right? He's back to 100% again. And he even has whatever energy I had residually in my staff. He's more powerful than he was before. And so literally her response is, we're basically doomed. There's no way our world can be safe. And even Stephen Strange himself says that, right? He's like, with this level of power that you're dealing with here, there's no way to save your world. It's going to fall and it's going to be destroyed. And even Despair tells Stephen Strange, that's the goal here, right? The goal of Titan Hulk is to siphon all the gamma radiation off of this world and any other world that exists in this universe and then destroy the universe and move on to the next one, right? So in a lot of ways, what it looks like Donnie Cates is doing is kind of building off of what Al Ewing did, sort of giving us this depiction of the events that took place between the time when the one below all seized control of the Incredible Hulk and that futuristic story where the one above all had been traveling throughout the multiverse and just wiping out whole universes over and over and over again. It's not explicitly told to us that's what this is, but it would be a cool place to kind of fit it into. So it's awesome. It's a really, really cool depiction on this thing. But again, one of the things to understand and just demonstrating the sheer level of power that Titan Hulk has, not even Stephen Strange can stop this guy. Now you can make transitive property arguments, right? And we can cook the books in power scaling and say, well, you know, you know, maybe he's more powerful than Dormammu or something like that. I don't definitively know. But what I will tell you is a being as capable as Titan Hulk, seemingly imbued with the power of the one below all, is enough to go against virtually anybody out there and it doesn't matter who they are. So no wonder Stephen Strange can't beat this guy. And so what ends up happening here is Banner starts talking to the Incredible Hulk in his own mind. Because remember, the physical form of Hulk, Banner, whatever you want to call it, that's Titan Hulk running around. But inside 
inside the mine, Banner and Hulk are kind of trapped there. And so what Banner starts doing is talking to the Hulk and saying, you have to do something. We have to manifest. Something has to happen here. Like if we do nothing, this entire world and all the Hulks on it will be completely eradicated. We'll be stuck here because Stephen Strange will inevitably die. And then this Titan Hulk will literally travel to our homeworld, wipe out everybody there, and we'll be helpless to do anything but just sit there and watch it happen. So if you care about nothing, Hulk, then continue doing nothing. But if the lives of the people here matter, and if the lives of everybody at home matters, then do something. Step up and do something. And it's one of the coolest things, right? Because while that's going on, Titan Hulk is dominating everybody, right? Like, Stephen Strange opens up a portal to try to get the occupants of this, this Hulk planet to, like, a different world. Titan Hulk, like, basically rips a hole through that reality, like, tears a hole in reality and then jumps through. I mean, it's crazy. The only time we've ever really seen a being based on physical power do anything like this was during the Tryon Juggernaut story. If you guys remember that, when Tryon Juggernaut was punching holes in reality, it was nuts, right? We covered that, and in fact, we'll remaster it because it's just a ridiculously amazing story. But it was just this OP version of Juggernaut punching holes in the universe. It was nuts. It's not something that we see very often. And so what ends up happening is that because of the pleading of Banner, the Incredible Hulk, finally steps up. Now, the irony of this is that when the Hulk does step up, the Titan Hulk persona basically tells him, there's nothing I need from you anymore, right? Like, I've siphoned off everything I need. I've got your physical body. Nothing here matters. But something to understand here is that the entire basis, the entire foundation of the Titan Hulk's existence is predicated on the Hulk itself. If the Hulk isn't there, the Titan Hulk's power basically wanes because there's nothing for that persona to latch onto. There's nothing for it to become a part of, right? Like, it's a really interesting prospect because what this does is it actually leads to both Banner and Hulk working together and then punching a hole through Titan Hulk and then leaving the physical body, right? Like actually exiting out of the physical body. When that happens, Hulk reverts back into Banner's form and then in turn, the entire conflict ends, right? You literally switch over to Banner in Strange Academy. Now, here's the thing, and this is something that caught me off guard, right? Because it just suddenly ends, and it's just like, what? Like, it's just, it's suddenly over. The reason why the story ends this way is because Donny Cates, the guy who's writing this, is basically taking a mental health break. He's walking away from the Incredible Hulk series, so it just ends suddenly, like, without any real, any, any real thing. The only thing we're given here is some measure of an epilogue where basically Doc Samson writes a letter to Bruce Banner telling him, like, none of us blame you for anything that's happened, none of this is your fault or anything like that, right? Like, you should come back to Planet Hulk sometime or Hulk Planet or whatever and hang out, right? It'd be really cool if we all hung out and did God Ball and all that kind of stuff, right? As far as Titan Hulk's concerned, its power is basically non-existent, right? Like, it's just not really there anymore. The force of power that was being used to create it has effectively left. And of course, we end up finding out that source of power ends up transitioning back to the person that originally gave it, who's basically the leader who's imbued with the power of the one below all from Al Ewing's run, right? The leader, of course, being a former Incredible Hulk villain. But like, it just ends. All of a sudden, right? It's just like, and we're done. And and that's basically it because Donny Cates, his entire run was cut short because he was focusing on a mental health break. So a very lackluster ending to what was otherwise a phenomenal Incredible Hulk story. But thank you all for watching and I will catch you all later. Peace.